Welcome to First Baptist Church Fort Mill. My name is Taylor Braswell. I'm one of the pastors here and we are so excited you've joined us online today to worship and hear from God's Word. We've loved hearing from you during this time and want to continue to know what's going on in the life of you and in the life of your family so that as a church family we can come alongside you and be praying for you. And you can actually send us an email at pray at fbcfm.com. Today, Pastor Jeff Bedwell is continuing in his sermon series titled, It's All About Jesus. We pray today's message encourages you and strengthens you as we begin this Christmas season.
Glad you're here. I hope that uh, your Christmas preparations are going well. And as part of our Christmas preparations, we've been using this Advent season to remind ourselves that Christmas uh, is all about Jesus. And we've been focusing on different aspects of uh, who Jesus is to be able to appreciate the greatness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to start today with, uh, with a story. It was September of 19. 1940. Will Toyd Pilecki, a Polish army captain, did the unthinkable. He snuck into Auschwitz. That's right, into Auschwitz, the notorious Nazi concentration camp. Pilecki knew that something was terribly wrong in the concentration camp, and as a committed Christian and a Polish patriot, he couldn't sit by and watch. He wanted to get information on the horrors of Auschwitz, but he knew the only way that he could really do that would be from the inside. So his supervisors approved a daring plan. They provided a false identity card with a Jewish name, and then Pilecki allowed the Germans to arrest him during a routine Warsaw Street roundup. Pilecki was sent to Auschwitz and assigned inmate number 4859. Pilecki, a husband, a father of two, later said, I bade farewell to everything I had known on this earth. He became just like any other prisoner, despised, beaten, threatened with death. And from inside the camp, he wrote, the game I was now playing at Auschwitz was dangerous. In fact, I had gone far beyond what people in the real world would consider dangerous. He began in 1941 as prisoner number 4859 to, to start to work. He, he organized inmates into resistant units. He boosted morale. He was documenting war crimes. Pilecki used couriers to smuggle out detailed reports of the atrocities. By 1942, he had also helped to organize a secret radio station using scrap parts. The information he supplied from inside the camp provided the Western Allies with key intelligence information about Auschwitz. In the spring of 1943, Pilecki joined the camp bakery where he was able to overpower a guard and escape. Once free, he finished his report estimating that around two million souls had been killed at Auschwitz. When reports reached London, officials thought he was exaggerating. Of course, today, we know that he was right. Here's how a contemporary Jewish journalist summarized Pilecki's life. Once he set his mind to the good, he never wavered. He never stopped. He crossed the great human divide that separates knowing the right thing from doing the right thing. It's an extraordinary act to place himself into Auschwitz. But as great as that divide that Pilecki overcame, greater still is, is the greatness of the divide that Jesus crossed. As we think about Him coming in Christmas time, we, we grow to appreciate the greatness of who Jesus is, that, that He came to this world radically distorted and, and destroyed by sin. And it is only as we appreciate the greatness of who Jesus Christ is that we really appreciate the greatness of what he did. Last week, uh, we, we said that very often, false teaching and thinking about Jesus doesn't seek to deny him, but to dethrone him. It will allow Jesus to be prominent, but not preeminent. That's why last week we spent time reminding ourselves that, that Jesus is King. And today we want to focus in on the fact that Jesus is God. And as God, He can't just be a prominent place in our life, but He must be 
preeminent. In fact, as, as, as the, the song we've been looking at, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, that Charles Wesley put together, he talks about how this God became human being. Christ, by heaven, highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold Him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald, angels sing, glory to the newborn king. When we look at Christmas, we are looking at Jesus, God who overcame the greatest divide and stepped into human history in a human body. And what we want to remind ourselves of today is the the preeminence of Jesus Christ, that He is indeed preeminent. And as the, the preeminent one, He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. So let's look at the preeminence of Christ and then just the fact that He is God. How should we respond to that? I want to take us back to kind of our foundational Scripture in this series, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Look at the the words that Paul stacks up there to describe Jesus Christ. He is God. He is God. He is the the image of the invisible God. The, The invisible God made visible in Jesus Christ. He is the exact revelation of what God is really like. God so wanted us to understand Him that He went to extraordinary lengths to reveal Himself to us in Jesus Christ. He is God. But he is also described as firstborn. He is firstborn. This means of of first importance, of of first rank. It's a term of position. It is is one who is, some of the translations will say, above all creation. Now let me pause here for a moment. Some folks look at this scripture verse, sometimes they'll take this and they'll twist it, and they'll say, aha, this means that Jesus wasn't God. He wasn't eternal because he was the firstborn, so he was born. But firstborn, as we find it in Scripture, go back even to the Old Testament, it's not so much a a position of order as is a position of rank. It is is a term of position, of, of honor. He is firstborn in taking on humanity. He became first. He is above all creation. In fact, is that the psalmist said, and I will make him the firstborn the highest of the kings of the earth. That that it wasn't the the, the order of birth, it was a position, a position of honor, a a rank. And so sometimes you would find even in the Old Testament, someone would give up their birthright. Someone else would become, have the honor of being the firstborn, even though they weren't first biologically in the order. He is the firstborn of first importance, of first rank. And then Paul describes him as he 
is the creator. He is the creator. He, he is the one who created. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things were created through him and for him. That Jesus is described, he's not just this little baby in a manger, but this is God. This is the creator God who is present. And it was not only created through him, but it was created for him. For him. He is the owner. He is the owner. It is, we all, all of creation belongs to him. He is the owner of all, the creator of all. He is the owner of all, but he is also the sustainer of all, the one who keeps it all together. Verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, some of you are Avengers uh, movie fans. You've seen the Avengers series. And, and in, the, in the movie, I think it was Infinity War, where the, uh, Thanos, the, the, the evil, the bad guy, uh, has collected these infinity stones, and he's getting ready to wipe out half of the world's population. And, and I remember the scene in the movie where you, you see the, these people just start disintegrating. And they, they just, you know, just kind of blow off into dust and blow off into nothingness. And as I watched that scene in the film, I thought, wow, that's what would happen if for one moment God ceased to be the sustainer of the universe. Not only our bodies, but all of creation would fall apart. He is God who is the Creator, who is the owner of all who sustains it all he holds it all together but Paul also describes him as the head of his body his body being the church the head of the body the church he is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead that he might be preeminent that he might be preeminent in all things so that when we talk about the church it's it's not my church it's not your church we get to be a part of it by his grace but it is his church he created it he bought and paid for it with his life his death his burial his resurrection he is the head he is the authority he is the lord he is the one we look to and follow because he is worthy he is the head of his body, the church. But Paul also says, never forget that he is our hope. That he is our hope. Did you notice how he described it? For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. All, all the fullness of God comes into this human body. And then he goes on, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Why do we rejoice at Christmas? Why is there good news? Because God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. That the fullness of God took on human flesh, crossed the greatest divide to step into a sin-marred and scarred and distorted world so that He could rescue us by living the life that we were designed and created and called to live, dying the death that our sin and our rebellion deserved to die and setting us free to be forgiven, to be restored, to be reconciled by His shed blood. Uh, Peter also also talks about that hope that we have. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from 
the dead. That He, he is the one who has, has brought us to this place of reconciliation. That He is the firstborn from the dead. So that we too can experience that resurrection through the shed blood, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has brought us hope. Now here's, here's why we've spent time with this. Because there's always a pull in our world to lessen who Jesus is. But if we're going to live in a commitment to the truth about Jesus, we must refuse to lessen Him. Recognize and refuse the temptation to lessen Him, to make Him less than He is. He is not less than God. I read of a story of the, the famous theologian Karl Barth had, had, had preached one time and a, a man came up to him and he said, he said to him, he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm an astronomer, as you know, and I have concluded that as far as I'm concerned, the whole of Christianity can be summed up by saying, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Garbar thought for a moment, and he said, well, I'm just a humble theologian, and as far as I'm concerned, the whole of astronomy can be summed up by saying, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. <laughs> Ouch! Right? Of course, the complexities of the universe can't be summarized and understood and appreciated in twinkle, twinkle, little star. And just the same way, we can't lessen the greatness of Jesus Christ by just trying to make Him a moral teacher who told us, do good, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He certainly taught that, but He did and is so much more. And what I want you to be aware of, what I want you to celebrate and appreciate and even go deeper in, in meditating upon the implications of is the greatness of Jesus Christ. That He is God from the beginning. And He crossed that great divide for you and for me. But as we continue to, to look at the Scripture, most particularly the, the events around the Christmas narrative, I want you to see a, just a few other things very quickly about what this story reminds us about who our God is. And one of the first things it reminds us is that He is powerful. That he is powerful. That the angel comes and makes the announcement to Mary that you're going to have this child. And she says, listen, this doesn't make sense. I, I'm not married. I've never been with a man. I mean, how is this going to be? And the angel gives her that great statement that have encouraged so many through the years. For nothing, nothing will be impossible with God. Why? Because the God who created the universe out of nothing. The God who took up human flesh. The Jesus who healed and, and walked on water and fed the thousands and all of the things that He did is a powerful God. And that God has gone to extraordinary lengths to reach out, to connect, to reconcile to you and to me. Christmas reminds us that our God, Jesus, is powerful. But not only powerful, but we have a God who is faithful who is faithful. John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, had that angelic messenger come, and he, he didn't believe the message that he was going to have a child who would be the forerunner of the Messiah initially, and so he was struck. He was unable to speak for months. And finally, when John the Baptist was born, his, his tongue was loosed as he named him John in obedience uh, to the angelic proclamation. And then he begins to prophesy about his son's role, but about the one who is to come, the one that his son will point to. And in that prophecy, he celebrated the faithfulness of God. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, 
For he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. The prophecies, hundreds of years old. God is faithful to deliver. The God who came to us at Christmas, the God who reaches out to us is a powerful God, but He is a faithful God. He is faithful to us. He is faithful to His Word. He is faithful to His promises. But we also know that He is a loving God. What is it that compelled Him to come to us? in our sin, in our rebellion. What is it that would cause him to come? It was love. For God so loved the world. He did something out of love. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life that he did it because of love. Paul said, but God shows his love for us in in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still in our rebellion, while we were still lost in our, our sin, that he came to live, he came to die for us. And when you understand the greatness of Jesus, when you understand that he is not just a good man, he was not just a moral teacher or the beginner of a movement, but this was God in the flesh, you begin to appreciate who he is. You begin to respond differently. C.S. Lewis wrote these words. We may note in passing that he, Jesus, was never regarded as a mere moral teacher. He did not produce that effect on any of the people who actually met him. He produced mainly three effects, hatred, terror, adoration. There was no trace of people expressing mild approval. And I think the same is true today. That Jesus didn't come for a mild approval, for us to have a a little of Jesus as a part of our gift-giving celebration. If you understand who Jesus is, it may terrify you. In sin, it may even bring up hatred. But if you truly understand the greatness of our sin and our need, the greatness of His love, the greatness of His person and His holiness, the greatness of what He's done, it calls forth adoration. So how do I know? How do I know that I am beginning to grasp the truth of who Jesus is? Well, we know we've recognized the truth about Jesus when it changes our lives. When it shows up in the way that we live our one and only life. And so what I want to do with the few moments that we have remaining is just to give you three words. Three words to kind of hang your hat on. Three words to hang on to that that may help you to begin to think about and shape how you are responding to Jesus who is God. Responding to Him as our God. The first word I want to give you is a reordering. A reordering that when we understand who Jesus is, when we understand that he's much more than just a moral teacher, much more than just a religious guru, that this was God in the flesh, it calls for a reordering of our life, a reprioritizing of of who and what is important so that we, we see, as we just read in Colossians, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Not just in the religious section of the pie of our life, 
But in everything, in every decision, in every relationship, in every way that we use our time, our energies, our money, that He would be preeminent. That He would be the first priority. He would be the the highest order. Because that is who He is. Paul Tripp challenges us. He says, you see, all of our hearts live and respond under the rulership of something. And there are only two options, God or something He created. Let me say it this way. It is only when God is in His rightful place of rule in our hearts that people are in their appropriate place in our lives. Sit with that for a moment. You and I can keep the second greatest commandment that you shall love your neighbor as yourself only if we keep the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your being. If God is not in His rightful place, guess who we insert in His place? Most frequently, ourself. When we recognize who He is, We recognize that we will will either allow Him rightfully recognize and respond to Him and reorder our life as He is the preeminent one, or we will seek to put someone or something else in first place. It calls for a reordering of our life, but it also calls, second word, for a relinquishing. For a relinquishing that we, we release, we give up some things. And after all, isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what Christmas is indeed all about? Well, Paul writes about it this way in Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves. This ought to be our mindset, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The the one who humbled himself, God has exalted. The one who relinquished all the the, the rights of heaven, all the the, the privileges of, of being in glory, he gave that up to fulfill the Father's calling. So earlier in Philippians, Paul would say, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. That's the mindset of someone who has relinquished their life to the greatness and the glory of the one who is God, Jesus Christ. He would write to the Galatians uh, these words, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. (laughs) There is something radically different about my life, Paul says. I have relinquished my self-rule. I have relinquished it to the rightful rule and reign of Jesus Christ, the one who is king. Hear me this morning. Christmas is not primarily about coziness, but about calling. When we tend to think culturally uh, about Christmas as big about comfort and coziness, I, I think about some of the popular Christmas songs, right? I'll be home for Christmas. You can plan on me. Please have snow. 
and mistletoe and presents by the tree. Christmas Eve will find me where the love light gleams. I'll be home for Christmas, if only in my dreams. Doesn't that just sound warm and cozy and comfortable? And we like that. We long for that. We, we enjoy that. Chris, chestnuts roasting on an open fire. <laughs> Jack Frost nipping at your nose, right? Or we used to sing that as kids, chipmunks roasting on an open fire. Jack Frost stick it up your nose, right? <laughs> That's not very comfortable there. But, but what, what I want you to hear is that Christmas was not Jesus saying, I'll be comfortable. But Jesus fulfilling the Father's calling. And if we are going to follow Jesus, we'll have to again and again and again choose calling over comfort, calling over coziness, to relinquish our rights so that we can do what is right, so that we can fulfill His calling, His creation design for us. We're going to have to think counterculturally when the culture says, comfort coziness our highest value has to be calling doing what is right fulfilling god's calling upon our lives there is relinquishment but you hear those words and maybe it starts to sound onerous but i want you to hear one other word as we respond to jesus who is our god and that is the word rejoicing that we rejoice why did jesus come why did he give up his rights why did he take on human flesh why did he live in this world why did he go to the cross the scripture says for joy Looking to Jesus, the author of Hebrews says, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That when we understand who Jesus is, when we understand his calling upon our life, even at times if it's not comfortable, even at times if it's challenging, even at times as it calls us to, to relinquish something along the way, we do it with a joy. We do it rejoicing. When Jesus was teaching one of his parables, he talked about the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up he finds this great treasure worth more than anything he's ever seen or known and what does he do then in his joy in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field he didn't say boy i'm really sacrificing boy this is really hard no no it was joy because he had discovered the greatness of the treasure hidden in the field when we understand the greatness of our god the greatness of his kingdom it becomes joy that we follow him jesus when he talked about uh, the, the, the 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 life that we have even at times when we're persecuted said rejoice in that day and leap for joy for behold your reward is great in heaven for so their fathers did to the prophets even if you experience persecution you can experience joy and jesus talked about his commandments these things i have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full Oh, when we understand the greatness of Jesus, following Him, re re renouncing, it, uh, it becomes a time of rejoicing because we understand the greatness of who He is. Some missionaries that moved to a predominantly Muslim nation, and they first moved to the, the Middle East, they, they talked about, some of their experience let me share with you some of their words when we first moved to the middle east we heard that on festival days everyone dresses in their best clothes and goes to visit their relatives and neighbors to celebrate so for our first 
Eid festival. We carefully cleaned our apartment, dressed up in our best clothes, got some sweets and chocolates, which are traditional to hand out to visitors, and waited in our house. But no one came to visit. Later, some other missionaries explained what they did wrong. They said, on festival days, the small visit the big, and the big give out the presents. For example, in a family, uh, the family visits the eldest brother or the parents or the grandparents. When they arrive, they would kiss the hand of the older person to show respect and honor. The host would then care for their guests by feeding them, serving them, giving them gifts like good quality chocolate, money, or other presents. As newly arrived foreigners without social standing or relatives, naturally, no one came to visit us. We were small in that culture. So we are the ones who needed to do the visiting. They write, that incident made me ponder about the awesomeness of the incarnation. In every other religion, humans, small, tried to visit God. <laughs> try to build up their own strength or their own good works or their own morality to be able to qualify to go into God's presence. But in the incarnation, God decided to play both the role of small and big. He humbled himself totally to become small, to take on human flesh in a sin-scarred world so that he could visit us in our squalid house. But he is also big, because he played the role of host and gave gifts, the gift of atonement, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of cleansing, the gift of reconciliation, which means that now we as believers can be appropriately dressed and enter into his house without disrespecting it. Christmas is good news of great joy that God has become man so that we might become who and what He created and called us to be. But Christmas is also an invitation. An invitation by God. Look what I have done to come near to you. Come near to me. I don't want to be merely a concept, but I invite you into a relationship. That's the good news of Christmas. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you that our God, creator, sustainer of the universe, the one who is preeminent over all, chose to become small, to dwell in human flesh so that you could come to us and do for us what we could not do for ourselves, so that you could bring us to yourself, that you could forgive us, restore us, reconcile us. No wonder it's good news of great joy. And so, Father, I pray today that you would help all of us to have a greater understanding and a greater appreciation of who you are and what you have done. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to fully and completely respond to you. We pray this now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen just going to leave you with some very simple and yet critical questions. To you, who is Jesus? Because that's the most central question of all. If he's just a moral teacher, if he's just a religious guru, take your pick. But if he is God, that changes everything. Who is he, and how are you currently responding to Jesus our God? Are you reordering your life? Are you relinquishing your right?
Are you living, rejoicing in all that He has provided? And that only comes as you know Him personally as Savior and Lord. And if we can help you to understand that better, if you would like to continue a conversation about that, please reach out to us. Uh, Send us an email, pick up a phone, uh, go to our website, uh, click the next steps at the the very top and just quickly just check a box and give us a contact information. We would be delighted to follow up with you, to talk with you more about what it means to understand who he is and how to respond to him. But if you're here as a follower of Jesus Christ it's also a good news that you have to share and so who are you praying for who's that one that you would desire most that they would come to a saving knowledge of Christ how uh, might you this Christmas share the good news of Jesus Christ with them and then as you think about just the greatness of Jesus as God who can you share these truths with who can you unpack them with to drive them home into your life but to share them in the lives of other people. He is God, and He has come, and His coming makes all the difference now and for all eternity. Let's rejoice in that good news. Let's gladly reorder our lives with Him as being the preeminent one, and let us relinquish our lives, because in relinquishing our lives, we find them. That's the good news and the great gift of Christmas. God bless you. Hey, we hope today's message encouraged you and strengthened your relationship with Christ. If you feel like God's working in your life or you have any questions about our church or about the sermon you just heard, we would love to come alongside of you. And you can email us at pray at fbcfm.com. Again, we want to thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving during this time. Your generosity continues to help make resources like this available. You can give online at fbcfm.com slash give. Again, we want to continue the conversation with you throughout this week on social media. Thank you so much for joining us today.